Um, this place was an amazing department to work for until the backstabbing and the personal attack started for my immediate supervisor and the first. And if you don't know who the first is, the first of nothing. To the chief and the first of nothing, you guys are in denial. You think you're doing an amazing job. In reality, you have destroyed this police department and the morale, except for your circle, which you definitely took care of. I thought that Acevedo was bad, but at least one thing for sure, I knew where he was coming from. To the first, you have a nasty attitude. So do yourself a favor and take some interpersonal skill classes so you know how to treat people right. And finally, to my immediate supervisor, Major Garrido, you are a liar, a snake in the grass, a cancer to this department. The hardest thing of being a female in this department was being surrounded by many males, knowing that I was more of a man than you. Anyway, please take care of yourselves, back each other up, because they don't care about you, your family, and the biggest thing they advocate. This is Billy Corbin signing in on the Because Miami podcast, and that was 30-year veteran Miami Police Sergeant Madeline Garcia signing off on Thursday morning this week. Uh, What they do at the end of the shift is they basically say, you're off duty, Godspeed, good luck. She served over 30 years. Take the mic, take the floor. And that was a radio broadcast that went over, uh, went out over the airwaves to everyone in the entire city of Miami Police Department. Sergeant Garcia was apparently being forced uh, into retirement uh, after, as I said, over 30 years. Um, Who she mentions in there, you might recall, uh, Acevedo, she says. Acevedo was the police chief who was brought in. Mayor Francis Suarez called him the uh, Tom Brady and Michael Jordan of police chiefs, uh, and he was here to clean up the mess and the morale and the corruption in the department. And then six months later, after he called out corruption in the city of Miami commission, he got fired by those same commissioners who he claimed of being corrupt and acting like a mafia. Uh, and so I've got sources in the department who tell me, and this is a funny thing where I don't know if this is true or not, but I was told that, uh, that some police officers were trying to cut Sergeant Garcia off while she was doing her, you know, you know, mid mic drop here, but yet they, they have a new radio system that doesn't allow them to interrupt each other. So she just, I mean, she had the floor as long as her finger was on the trigger. I heard some beeps at the end of that clip. Uh, I was wondering if that was their way of cutting her off. It's possible. Yeah, it does sound like it was kind of abrupt at the end. It also just seems like she might have literally dropped uh, dropped Mike. Um, but this is what uh, sources are telling me, that the department is currently in shambles. That is a million times worse than it was when Art Acevedo was the chief. Uh, here's, here's an interesting quote. We'd all take a pay cut to get Acevedo back. All right? Uh, Acevedo... Came, came to clean up the corruption in the department, and as soon as he was gone, it got worse. The corruption has intensified. These are all from police sources that I'm giving you this, this information from. Every unit in the police department has felt it. Communications, patrol, field training officers, everyone. People are leaving, quitting. They're abandoning retirement benefits. So people are retiring or leaving early leaving like hundreds of thousands of dollars in benefits on the table because they just can't take it uh, anymore. Um, apparently, the department is going into, going over budget in overtime because people just ain't showing up. They're calling in, and so they have to just keep officers on who are willing to show up for work and giving and paying them overtime. Uh, it, it, even, like, even the people, apparently, who are paid to repair the building because the police department the, the headquarters in downtown Miami is literally falling apart. The parking garage, it's reported, has been collapsing. The government has known about it for, for like since like 2016, and they haven't done a damn thing about it. And now the maintenance workers who are supposed to fix the building, they don't even want to show up for work because the, the environment is so toxic. Um, people are try, uh, calling it a friends and family plan, basically saying that uh, – the people who are in with the politicians, who are in with the with the chief, they've been given a green light to just act with impunity. There are more EEOC related lawsuits coming, uh, claiming that their rights as employees have been violated. Um, and uh, in in twenty plus thirty plus years, officers have never seen it as bad in this department as we're doing now. 
of course, all of this, you know, you hear from me all the time. Oh, my Miami is a mess. The government is a mess. Don't take it from me. Take it from Sergeant Garcia. She's been in this government working to protect and serve this city for over three decades. And she told you herself. So when Francis Suarez goes out in the world, Mayor Ponzi Postalita and says, hey, Miami, it's great. It's beautiful. Everything's here. We have good government. We have we're pro business. All that. It's bullshit. He's a fraud, a con man, a liar. Okay, because remember, Miami is the place where the truth is hate and lies are love. Where we don't have reality, we have realty. So everyone's just trying to sell you property, sell you to be the 1,000 newcomers to Florida tomorrow. But nobody's actually working to make quality of life better or this government any more functional. We have been exclusively reporting on this very podcast, Roy, that uh, as of last year, Over 40 senior professionals have resigned or been forced out of city of Miami government. So what's happening is that, like, as the best and brightest, they say, from all over the world have been flocking to Miami, okay, making it the least affordable city in the entire world or entire country, the city of Miami has, has been experiencing a brain drain. There is a mass exodus due to toxic morale, horrendous working conditions and absolute debilitating corruption and dysfunction. Uh, This is a city notorious for for all of those things. And yet somehow veterans, not only in the police department, but in this government are saying they've never seen it this bad. This is the work of Francis Suarez. This is the work of city manager Art Noriega, the work of city attorney uh, uh, Vicky Mendez, the work of the entire city commission, including... Yeah, that's Joe Carollo we're talking about. The the wannabe tin pot dictator and king of uh, Calle Ocho who uh, runs this entire city with an iron fist. Although there's there's a there's a new uh, new new person in town who's pulling Joe's strings, Mark Sarnoff, who we'll talk about uh, if not later today, uh, certainly next week. Because um, Joe Joe is apparently uh, being emasculated, being he's being taken over uh, now, and that's kind of that's kind of fun. It's a, it's a newish character. Wasn't Mark Sarnoff instrumental in the Marlins getting to the ballpark? And instrumental in the Mel Reese uh, soccer stadium real estate a boondoggle. This guy is is uh, uh, he was commissioner boondoggle, and he is he is back at it again. We talked about him on the program before, but he is a funny, shady, almost George Santos like character, a guy who we don't know to this day. Even though he's been in Miami for decades and been a, a city commissioner, was a city commissioner for nine years, we still don't know where the hell the guy came from. He's one of those classic Miami characters, and he is now controlling uh, the the commission, including Joe Carollo and Alex Diaz Laportia, and he is pulling the strings in this District 2 uh, special election that we've been talking about a lot on the uh, on the program. Um, even in the city of Miami, where we are most vulnerable to climate change and sea level rise, we know it floods in a it floods in a, not only does it flood in a drizzle, it floods on a sunny day during king tide season here in Miami, but the city of Miami has lost three chief resiliency officers in two years. The last one, get this, she was hired after a nationwide search. She relocated from Georgia to come here for the job, and she quit after two months. So after two months of seeing what Miami's all about, she split. So I keep telling people, do not move to Miami, at least not the city of Miami. If you want to move to Miami-Dade or some of the other municipalities, look into it. But do not, do not invest your money Move your family, put your kids in school, buy property, open a business, God knows. Until you do your due diligence, watch a city commission meeting. You will head for the hills, literal higher ground. You will want to get the hell away from this place, okay? You 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 need to find, like, a, a place with, like, a more stable regime, like Caracas. I don't know, because uh, this is absolutely a cesspool, and it's getting worse. That happened this week. That was Thursday morning. Sergeant Madeline Garcia, veteran of over three decades of the Miami Police Department, I mean, just telling them what's what. And that was kind of classic. The dispatcher's like, we love you, we'll miss you, mazel tov, good luck, it's been an honor. And then she's like, fuck all (laughs) y'all. It was just, oh, man. That's the thing about this town, dude. I mean... What I always say, um, uh, Los Angeles is where you go when you want to be somebody. New York is where you go when you are somebody. And Miami is where you go when you want to be somebody else. 
It's always been a sunny place for shady people. We have always attracted con men, con women, schemers, scammers. Um, the mayor is no different, obviously. Not only is he himself a con man, but he put out a for sale sign in front of City Hall. And, and during this pandemic said, send us all of your, your schemes and scams and Ponzi's. Uh, anybody but your poor. We hate the poor. That's what he said uh, about Miami. And uh, but why? Because we sustain our economy this way. That's the thing. We don't really have any indigenous. We don't really have any indigenous industry. Uh, we subsist from hustle to hustle. And so we need, you know, every Ponzi scheme, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, or, or any illicit trade, whether it's cocaine, money laundering, um, uh, real estate hustles, cryptocurrency, whatever it may be, that's what fuels the economy of Miami. Funny thing about the the fraud that Francis is trying to sell to everybody about the city of Miami, that this is like a functioning place and a good government and and a safe place as well. Um, Francis Suarez, you may have heard, Roy, is running for president. I'm sorry, what? Yes, we, there may very well be uh, the new PPP, President Ponzi Postalita. Oh, Jesus Christ. He's, he's, so he is already, um, he has a political committee that is running ads in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. Those are like the first three uh, primary states where he in, expects to be on the ballot. So he needs to introduce himself to the, to the people in those states. Uh, and now he is launching, <laughs> hang on, get this, with this news about the police department today, dude, um, Francis Suarez is launching a 10-city tour, okay, with former Donald Trump advisors' crime-fighting coalition. So he can, get this, he can uh, tell people how to fix crime in their cities. He says, quote, crime is a local problem. <laughs> what? Yes. <cri> <laughs> I know. Dude, I know. After everything that's gone down here, every, all the cops, everybody in Miami Police Department, not going to work. Not going to work and then retiring by telling everybody that the department is falling apart, both literal, both internally, externally, literally and figuratively. Uh, Francis Suarez says, quote, crime is a local problem and it's best prevented at the local level using bottom up solutions. Miami has successfully reduced violent crime using common sense solutions that fit our community. But, but so Francis Suarez going around right now on a 10 city tour talking about law enforcement and crime solving solutions. I'd rather hear this. From the cop in the village, people, Roy, I'd rather I, I, Officer Big Mac has more to say on this subject intelligently and with more profound experience and wisdom than Francis Suarez has. But this is his thing, man. He not only he is. The, this is the capital, not of capital. It is the capital of cons. And we have the biggest con as the mayor. It is. It would be a. It would be a comedy if it weren't so tragic. It would be a tragedy if it weren't so weren't so funny. Um, you know what they say, you know what what's the uh to paraphrase Mel Brooks, um uh tragedy is when I trip and fall into a well. Comedy is when you trip and fall into a well, you know. So everybody listening is like gets the Schadenfreude of just like, well, I'm I ain't in uh in Miami or I ain't in uh Florida. Speaking of not in Florida, Ellie Mistal will be joining us later to tell us about uh, how excited he is to not be in the uh, in the free state of DeSantistan uh, down here. Uh, Ellie is a friend of the show and always a fantastic uh, guest and interview. But let's talk about Mayor Ponzi Postalita. I you, you suppose he's emerged as I mean other uh, he's emerged as maybe like a favorite character on the show, other than perhaps Commissioner Joe Carollo. We do have another stinger, by the way. We so, have a stinger for... Huh? Oh, did I... Listen. I did mention... I did mention uh, DeSantistan. Also later in the program, some bonus video content. Those of you listening to the podcast, if you can check out the YouTube, you're going to get a really fun... Fun piece of bonus video content about our, our good friend, Commissioner Joe Carollo. Uh, 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 uh. 
dead air, dead air. <laughs> Killing me here. I'm, sorry, I'm prepping for this segment. I know. You keep moving left and right, and you can't see Roy. I mean, he is like, wow, it's exciting. He's like running back and forth. It's awesome. Roy is the classic sort of octopus board op. You know, he's just got it. He's everything's everything's under control uh <laughs> roy's in the uh in the captain's seat everything's under control and <laughs> won't fire don't worry, don't worry dan <laughs> it's just he's the, I, honestly i feel like i'm in an airbnb i feel like we're just gonna fuck this place up while dan's out we're just gonna <laughs> yeah well we're moving so might as well <laughs> what out yeah dan's gonna be like who glued my chair to the ceiling why is this <laughs> why is this happening we all know that francis suarez is mayor crypto bro in addition to being Mayor Ponzi Postalita, uh, when he was inaugurated as the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors last year, last January, uh, part of his whole speech is, we need to embrace innovation. And in order to do that, I'm asking all of my colleagues here, all of the mayors of the United States, to sign a crypto pact. Like, we are going to band together and say that we are going to push crypto forward um one year later francis suarez was on stage this month uh addressing that same group the u.s conference of mayors in a kind of i guess it's like a you know a state of the union kind of a thing and you know what he didn't mention once in that entire speech roy um i'm willing to guess crypto not once. Do you know that Francis Suarez had not tweeted the word crypto since last April? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that would be like Elon Musk not tweeting about Tesla. Like, well, like, like that's kind of his brand. It's kind of his his thing, right? Well, much like Tesla, crypto is literally burning on fire. That's very, very similar. It's a, it's in, it's, a, it's a Tesla winter, uh, if you will, uh, but. So Francis Suarez has been now all of a sudden trying to duck this crypto thing. Because as soon as your Ponzi goes belly up, you know, you didn't hear Nevin Shapiro talking a lot about uh, investing in groceries or anything like that. You know, you know, you didn't hear, uh, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff talk about, uh, you know, investing in his uh, 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 investing in his hedge fund or Alan Stanford talking about buying certificates of deposit on his bank in Antigua. Uh, you know, eventually the clock runs out uh, as a. Uh, Warren Buffett said in the Great Recession, he said that when the tide goes out, we find out who's been swimming naked. And Francis Suarez has been most certainly swimming naked, although nobody really uh, wants to see that. Maybe George Santos uh, wants to see that. Uh, but Francis Suarez was cornered on CNBC, on the Squawk Box program, and asked flat out, like, can't duck it. Here you are live. Ask some about, about crypto. Um, and here's here's the first comment how it, with how he feels about the crypto industry these days. Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. He's also the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, Ma Mr. Mayor, great to have you with us. Good to see you again. Great to be with you, of course. Likewise, um, you were overjoyed when FTX U.S. decided to um, put their headquarters in Miami. You welcomed them with open arms. You praised Sam Bankman Fried. Looking back on that, did you wish you asked more questions? Well, I think everybody who invested in FTX uh, wishes that they had clarity as to what was going on, uh, certainly behind the scenes. I think some of the smartest people uh, in the investment world uh, that were on their cap table uh, and did presumably extensive due diligence uh, and are much more sophisticated uh, and have more sophisticated due diligence tools than we have, um, were duped. And, 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 you know, when someone's doing things that are fraudulent, it's very difficult to detect that in the absence of that knowledge. And so uh, certainly I wish... Uh, for, you know, crypto in general, which has certainly taken a step back uh, in this crypto winter uh, as a result of uh, those scandals and as a result of the general market conditions, uh, I wish none of that would have happened. You know, I wish they would have been responsible uh, with their cu customers' money. And I think part of it is a failure on the part of, of governments to regulate them properly uh, in a way that would uh, put guardrails on what they could do with customers' money. Where do you begin with this? Where do you begin with this? I, yes, I wish that people had been more responsible. First of all, I'll say, like, who could have known? Who could have known this was a Ponzi scheme? We've been talking about this as a Ponzi scheme on this program for, like, it feels like, well, it feels a lot longer than it is. I'll tell you that right nobody's now. Nobody's listening. Like, nobody's listening. <laughs> Dan's not even coming into the do the show. Anymore. Nobody wants to do the show. 
uh, here with me. Roy's only here because he's being paid to be here. You're goddamn right, I am. <laughs> so pretty well, by the way. But first of all, who could have guessed? Number one. We needed more sophisticated due diligence. There's no doubt that man needs more sophistication, Francis Suarez. But uh, uh, what else did he say? Oh, we should have been more responsible. It's not just a matter of responsibility. He was out there promoting and shilling. This was Francis Suarez himself was doing a pump and dump. Also his nickname at Belen, but that's a story for another time. Hey, hey, hey. Also, that last part, Francis Suarez is complaining about a lack of government regulation in the crypto market. Why don't we go ahead and flash back to, I don't know, let's say Flashback Friday with Francis Suarez uh, himself from September of 21. Right, we want to make sure that we can be the most innovative uh, you know, city on the planet, the most innovative country on the planet. Uh, and we don't want to do anything that creates uh, regulation that kills uh, the innovation that we're seeing in this space. Oh, we have... An anti-regulation, Francis Suarez, who said that regulation, government regulation could kill the innovation in this space. And now he's blaming regulators for not killing innovation in this space because it turns out it was a Ponzi scheme. It's, it's a Ponzi scheme. That's the thing. It's a Ponzi scheme. And unfortunately, the Democrats believe that if you continue to grow government all the way to its logical extension as a solver of all problems, um, that it's going to create success. And all it's done in the history of humanity is create failure and oppression and misery. It was just from this past November. So he's still on this anti-regulation, not, not, not only small government kick, but anti-government kick. I love when people in government talk about how terrible and oppressive government is. And by the way, the reason why government is terrible and oppressive is because people like Francis Suarez are in it. He's right. He should resign from government and protect government from the people. That's how we could best do it. Francis Suarez has been in government practically his entire life. He's a second generation mayor. He was a city of Miami commissioner for eight years. Now he's been the mayor for five. And he wants to tell us about how shitty government is. We know how shitty government is. It's because you are in the government, Ponzi Postalita. It's unbelievable. Doesn't want regulation. It's, I, what do I, what do I, it's a practice what you preach situation. It's hypocrisy, flat out. Every time this guy opens his mouth on television, it's an embarrassment. I can bounce back and forth. I don't even need to say anything. I could bounce back and forth between Francis Suarez arguing with himself from months ago. Okay? He's saying dumb shit now, and he, and he, he said the exact opposite just a few months ago. I mean, l let's hear this other clip uh, from Francis Suarez just this past week on CNBC. Well, with all due respect, uh, you know, you don't know the future, nor do I. Uh, I think we live in a world where uh, when people lose money, right, or things don't go the way that they expect, everyone wants to blame someone. You know, uh, as you said, we live in a, in a capitalist country where people risk capital. Uh, sometimes it works out for them, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, and we have this, you know, and I think a lot of this is, with all due respect, media driven. Uh, where, you know, when something doesn't go right, uh, we have to find someone to blame for it, particularly when it involves just simply investing uh, in something. When something goes well, because, uh, you know, maybe in six months, Bitcoin is at 30,000, maybe it's at 40,000. I mean, are you going to have me back on your show and apologize to me and, and say that, you know, Mr. Mayor, you're brilliant, you were super smart, you know, to, to, to be um, someone who believed in, in technologies that have some fundamental benefits that the fiat system doesn't provide? Super smart. Wally e. Coyote. Super mm. Evil genius. Madre Dios. He's, I'm super smart, bro. Okay, where do I begin here? First of all, he was asked, we played that clip earlier about FTX. What he said about FTX when the county of Miami-Dade did the arena naming rights deal, he said, quote, it's awesome that we've attracted a huge cryptocurrency exchange, Mr. Suarez said, noting that FTX's bid, quote, complements the brand that Miami is establishing. As we know, he was he was right uh, about that, but just not in the way that uh, that he expected. Um, he also tweeted uh, after uh, SBF announced Sam Bankman uh, or what do they call him? Sam Bank Run Fraud announced that F FTX was moving its headquarters and opening its headquarters here in Miami. 
Francis Suarez wrote, Very honored to have your new U.S. headquarters moving to the MIA. FTX is one of the most innovative companies on the planet, and you, SBF, are one of the most innovative technologists. Welcome home. This is the important thing to remember is that this guy was pushing and pumping all this stuff. And what he was not saying, Roy, is what he just said on CNBC, which is that this was an investment that basically didn't do so good. He's previously said in the crypto winter that if uh, you, can, you shouldn't be investing money in anything that you can't afford to lose. Here's the thing. That was a totally different song than the one he's singing before when he was talking about the unbanked, when he was talking about... Uh, crypto as a hedge against inflation when he was talking about um, when he was giving out crypto wallets to children children at city hall with a hundred dollars in bitcoin to get them started you know what we call that we call that grooming what does a drug dealer say when he's trying to uh, indoctrinate a new uh, client a new addict the first one is free okay that was francis suarez preying on children and grooming them for this Ponzi scheme that was personally profiting him and his law firm and his buddies who were donating to his presidential campaign, okay? That's what was happening. It wasn't all this like, well, buyer beware, bro. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't acknowledging that this was a, a, an unregulated security. He wasn't acknowledging that. He was out there like an MLM pitchman screaming from the heavens about this. Bitcoin has the power to democratize and to create wealth for the unbanked and for the poor in our community who are getting decimated by inflation and government spending that has gone rampant. If you have a bank account today, guess how much interest you're earning? Zero. Zero. And it's worse than that. It's worse than that because of inflation, someone is sticking a hand in your bank account and taking money out because the purchasing power of your fiat currency, the fiat currency of the world is being diminished. And so we have to lean into this generational wealth creation opportunity so that the poor in our community don't get left behind like they always do when government intervenes. Absolutely predatory. And we know what has happened in this crash. And we've been warning about this with Miami Coin, which has now lost 99.3% of its value from its all time high. People keep saying, How long am I going to keep reporting on that? I say, Until it hits zero, which, by the way, it's never going to actually hit zero. zero. Roy, it's just going to tend to infinity is what's going to happen. Oh. At some, at some <laughs> point, it's, it's never going to lose 100% of its value. At some point, we're all just going to have to acknowledge. Or agree that it's worthless because it's going to be point zero zero zero. Yeah, it's going to be de- a running decimal. Right. It's not going to ever like be 100%, but right now it's down to point zero 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 four three or something like that. Um, but if you – and we know in the, the crypto collapse, um, because when Francis Suarez gave that speech that we just heard, that was April of 22, all right? At that point, Bitcoin – had already lost a third of its value from its all-time high in November of 21, okay? Within days of that speech, by the way, as the days went, it it just started to tick down, 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 down. Probably as Francis Suarez was talking at that Bitcoin conference in Miami in April of 22, it was just ticking down, down, down. And about a month later, I think it had lost, it dropped another 50% at that point. So the retail investors, see now Francis Suarez is on CNBC this week talking about how this was like a sophisticated securities instrument and required qualified investors who could afford to lose the money and uh, and who do we blame for that? But don't blame us. I blame it on the media. Meanwhile, this guy was out in the media every single day for years touting this Ponzi scheme. And now... He's completely ignoring the fact that he, like a lot of these folks, were preying on retail investors who could not afford to lose this money. We're talking about people who live paycheck to paycheck, people who might have to go to Amscot and pay a VIG just to cash their paycheck so they can pay their rent and buy their children food and clothing. Okay? And people who can't afford to make this investment, 
in this unregulated, unsecured security and just take a ride and see what happens and lose their life savings. Where is the SEC? I just don't understand. Where is the SEC? Why are they not down here passing out subpoenas? Why haven't they been down here passing out subpoenas? I mean, we have a massive fraud going on here in Miami being run out of City Hall in more ways than one. Where is the U.S. Attorney's Office? Where is the SEC? Help us, Gary Gensler. You are our only hope. Where are you? Um, It is a classic situation of if we don't laugh, we would have to cry. So it's time to take a deep breath, kick back with a little yacht rock, and jam out to the newest Because Miami single. I'm the most Bitcoin-friendly mayor on the planet. A coward, imposter, shameless double-crosser. He's a con man, a cheater, Ponzi postalita. A textbook scam artist, Mayor Francis Suarez loves his crypto. Heaven help us please. Miami's run by a crypto bro. Corrupt and vile, although he gets away with it all. Exploits the MBD to staff his private security. But who are we to contend that every villain doesn't need henchmen? Not unlike crypto. A coward, imposter, shameless double crosser. He's a con man. A cheater, Ponzi Postalita, a textbook scam artist, Mayor Francis Suarez is a crypto bro. We all invested, but where did it go? That's what we want to know. Mayor Crypto Bro. What if he runs for president? Nothing above board. That he can't afford Out in Coconut Grove The source of funding He would not disclose <laughs> Techie babble things Set on a pod With Sam Bankman free Your private property rights Cannot be vanished In the blink of an eye with Mayor Crypto Bro. A coward, imposter, shameless double-crosser He's a con man, a cheater, Ponzi postalita A textbook scam artist Mayor Francis Suarez is a crypto bro We all invested, but where did it go? That's what we want to know Mayor Crypto Bro What if he runs for president? We need to integrate Bitcoin into every aspect of our society. We need to make sure that you can go into a convenience store and buy a Snickers with a Satoshi. Miami coin could revolutionize the way governments are funded in the future. We could actually run the city without taxes. Everybody knows moronic dipshit crypto bros. But if you want to know who is the worst of them all, a coward, imposter, shameless double crosser. He's a con man, a cheater, Ponzi postalita, a textbook scam artist. Mayor Francis Suarez is a crypto bro. We all invested, but where did it go? That's what we want to know. Mayor Crypto Bro. If you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Ellie Mistal is the justice correspondent for the nation covering the courts, the criminal justice system, and politics. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School and a lifelong New York Mets fan because nobody's perfect. And the author of my favorite, the best-selling book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. It is his very first book, just released last year. It's one of the best books ever written about the Constitution, because whether you are a longtime scholar or fan uh, of the document or you're, you're relatively new uh, to it, uh, this is just has a, just a fabulous, unique, readable, fun, pop culture-centric 
uh, perspective on our nation's founding document. Ellie Mastal, welcome back to the program. A friend of the show. I'm I'm so excited to see you. So excited to have you back. And you're just sitting there wondering where the hell's Dan Levitard? Hi, <laughs> how, how you doing, Bill? No, I, I follow you on Twitter, so I feel like we we are simpatico. <laughs> oh, can we start there? Is Twitter? I I follow you on Twitter forever. And I don't see you in my feed anymore. Like, what's going on? Yeah, look, I don't, I don't know the how Elon Musk is is doing the algorithm to make sure that you know, uh, vaccine information and MAGA gets promoted and other people don't get promoted. But look, I'm on Twitter for the same reasons why I'm always on, why I've always been on Twitter. People read articles, and that's where I get paid. So right, well, it's so true. Like, the blues getting the priority, so like people though. Can, can see the. The articles that I write, I'm not there to like, you know, uh, support Elon Musk's, uh, you know, next mission to Mars. Um, and so that's why I kind of stay. I don't know if I'll stay. You know, look, my the, the number of times people have called me the N word um, have, have skyrocketed um, since Elon Musk took over. But I say to this, I say this to a lot of people skyrocketed back to where it was before. I mean, like, there was only a very brief period in time where I could, like, you know, go out on social media and not have people call me everything but a son of God. And so that was a nice hmm. time. But, like, now we're, like, back to, like, 2012, which I, th- I am, you know, unfortunately kind of used to. I, it's not... This is not my first rodeo with a racist white folks. I so. think I think Roy is is right, though. I think us, us legacy... Uh, blue checks don't really have the, the the priority. It is Twitter blue, not Twitter black. That's for sure. That that uh, that gets all the love these days from from uh, from Al, Al algorithm. Uh, Ellie, I have to ask you because we have to ask everybody. Do you have any classified documents in your home currently? I have been. I, I, you know, it's one of those things where I assume that I must, right? Because, right. It's just because apparently everybody's got them, right? So I've like looked under the couch cushions. I found my remote, didn't find any classified documents yet, but I'm still on the lookout. And here's the thing, Billy, the minute I do, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask for a special prosecutor it's because good call. apparently, good call. Yeah. apparently our United States attorney general is incapable of of conducting a simple investigation into whether or not public officials misused sensitive documents. So he's always got to go asking for outside help to do it. He's always got to go asking for Republican outside help to do it. So now I think everybody gets a special prosecutor, right? Mike Pence, he should get a special prosecutor. If I have anything wrong, I should get a special You're Nino doing Brown, Oprah. where's the special prosecutor Oprah, for him? Do it Oprah. I want- <laughs> do it Oprah style. Do it over. Right? You get a special prosecutor. You get a special prosecutor. This is great. Well, because apparently Merrick Garland is incapable of doing the job himself. Yeah, I, I, I actually should have checked my pandemic hair for classified documents. I remember I looked like you, Ellie. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember my like. I had that like pandemic hair. I, I looked like the like the lost BG. I don't know if you were. You remember my Jufro uh, back in the back in the pandemic days. Uh, thank God that's not only over, but never happened here in the state of Florida. Um, uh-huh. And and speaking of the state of Florida, but before I do this, because, of course, there were classified documents first initially found here in the great state, the great free state of Florida at, at Mar-a-Lago or Mag-a-Lago. What 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 impact do you think these these documents popping up everywhere, though, has on this special you know, the special prosecutor's investigation. Like, does this sort of like dilute it? Now Trump gets to say, oh, you see Pence had him and Biden had him and like now, now I didn't do anything wrong. It should, for people who are paying attention, it should put into stark relief the difference between uh, the MAGA king, Donald Trump, (laughs) and everybody else, right? Because everybody else, when they found the special document, the classified documents, they were like, here, take them back. We don't want them. (laughs) Pence gave them back. Biden gave them back. You know, I'm sure, you know, Jimmy Carter is in his attic right now. Is like, it turns out I got this special classified. Here, please take it back, sir. I'm, right? I'm, wor- like, I'm worried about all those houses he built. There could be classified documents all over the place at Habitats <laughs> for Humanity. Right? Like other presidents and public officials give them back. Only one president or former public official tried to keep them, hide them, and refused uh, and got ketchup all over them, right? So (laughs) that's the difference, right? And that should be put into stark relief. Unfortunately, again, because of Merrick Garland and his inherent weakness, I believe, what it will do, Billy, is what you said. I think it will just muddy the waters Mm. and give Merrick Garland or Jack Smith their... Uh, whatever, uh, 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 Michael Crichton or Tom Clancy or whoever <laughs> is is prosecuting this, will give them an excuse 
to not prosecute uh, Trump for his espionage um, because the wa waters have been muddy. That's my fear. Mm. It shouldn't, but that's what I fear will happen. Speaking of Florida, you are mercifully not from here, um, and I, I'm I'm endlessly curious what the impression is of people who who watch what's going on down here. Um, who see this brand of the free state of Florida attracting some of the worst people from around the country uh, to move here basically as a tax shelter and because they don't like Jews, black people, and the LGBTQ plus community. They, they don't like books. They don't like education. They don't like health care. They must not like homeowners insurance. They must not like, I mean, um, it's kind of like, you know, other than the weather and the view, kind of the worst of, of everything. And I, but I wonder, like, when you see this crazy, shit happening like what do you other than like thanking god above that you don't live down here like what what is the impression of, of ron DeSantis and the rest of the country the thing that gets me billy and, I, and i'm being entirely serious about this i i always don't understand why ron DeSantis and his you know extended brand man uh, uh band of conservatives why they are so hell-bent on making their children dumber than mine well, because like, that's like, how you, that's how you indoctrinate them into republicanism. I mean, you're, I people, guess, but people like, aren't they're born also going to have to compete in a world. They're going to have to compete in a global economy. They're going to have to compete against children like mine who know things. Yeah, but but they're going to have to compete. So, but no, no. More and, frightening is our kids are going to have to compete in idiocracy because that's what this world will become. Because pe children aren't babies are not born stupid and hateful. You have to groom them into that, and you have to do that. By by destroying the public education system, by banning AP Black History, by and that's how you uh, you know by banning uh, 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 you know body dysphoria and, well, and gender affirming care and uh, you know. Remember, well, what's really ha remember, folks. It's not just that he's trying to ban facts, right? It's not that he's trying to ban dates because history is not nearly merely the study of facts and dates, right? What he's trying to ban at at a, at a more core level is critical thinking. Right. He's trying right. to outlaw um, the ability for children to learn how to appreciate the world and think about it in a critically in a critical way. And that that attempt that that is old, that is old, man. That hmm. is an hmm. old attempt that authoritarian users have used throughout history to try to maintain their power. We've already seen a society that bans books, bans learnings, and tries to make it so that the only reliable pieces of information are the authoritarian leader and the church. We called it the Dark Ages, right? <laughs> but this is this is I'm, what I'm they sorry. did, right? I'm sorry. Did you so say? I, I did you say? Prop, Billy. Did you say dark? I a prop. So, yeah. so there is there is one book that Ron DeSantis, I promise you, has on his shelf. With, he's got it highlighted, post-it notes in it. It's this book. It's Machiavelli's The Prince. Mm. Because this book, this is the playbook for the DeSantis administration. It goes through exactly how you can manipulate a populace, you can manipulate a people to keep yourself perpetually in power. One of my favorite quotes, I'll just read it. A people will accept anything so long as you leave them their sheep and their women. That, is, that was Machiavelli's insight right that, See, sometimes we, sometimes those are one and the same uh for some <laughs> yeah. i thought you were going to say the bible <laughs> he uh, uh, uh ron's got the bible oh, too I, he's just Ron, he's Ron, never no, read it i wish it was the bible <laughs> yeah i wish he, it was the bible right, because the bible has some good things in it like stop being a dick right like that's, <laughs> that's a great thing from the my bible, favorite right? commandment <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Sanders ain't got no Bible. Sorry. He's got, he's got the authoritarian's playbook. Ali, I got to cut you off. You mentioned uh, the Dark Ages, and that sounds like black history, which has been banned here in uh, in Florida. So I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm sorry. Was that a Death Star mug that you just rose into frame yeah, there? Is that my, like, yes, that is a, yeah, yeah that is Tallahassee no right there. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it is Tallahassee right there. Ali, we are in the midst now of another another Supreme Court session what could possibly go wrong i'm curious what kind of fuckery we can expect what decisions are we most looking forward to slash dreading coming out of this what i would argue illegitimate court yeah so remember what last year the supreme court revoked roe v wade as many people know right and you know what happened nothing 
They didn't get there wasn't there there wasn't a mass uprising. Um, there wasn't a breakdown of society. They basically overturned Roe v. Wade and got away with it. Yes, there was some political fallout that, you know, Kevin McCarthy had fewer votes, and so he had to prostrate himself on national TV for a week. But, you know, but in terms of from, from where the court sits, nothing bad happened. And so once they got away with taking away, revoking a constitutional right for the first time in history. That's what that's what the Dobbs decision is. It takes away a constitutional right that was given for the first time in American history. And once they got away with doing that, they're just going to do it again and again and again. I like to think of it, the analogy that I've made before is they're like uh, Buffalo Bill in the movie Sons of the Lambs, right? They're, the, the, <laughs> once they get a taste Aye. for the killing of rights, they will never stop. They will keep killing rights and killing rights and killing rights um, until somebody makes them stop. And that's where we are. So this term, um, we're going to see the beginning of the revocation of gay rights. That's well in hand uh, uh, with a case about a, a woman who runs a marriage website, actually doesn't run a marriage website, wants to one day run a marriage website you get standing that doesn't that? serve the same-sex marriages. <laughs> They're going to give her um, the opportunity to do that. Um, they've started to to further entrench um, Christian fundamentalism at the exclusion of all other religions, allowing uh, 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 kind of public school officials um, to indoctrinate their kids uh, with prayer, Christian prayer. I'll, I'll point out, you know, it's never you never have a case where like a high school football coach is like, I'm sorry, kids, I need to turn and face Mecca five times a day. Please join. Yeah, you know, that case. Never gets to the Supreme Court, but if you're praying to Jesus, clear eyes, full hearts, uh, uh, can't, can't lose. lose. Then all of a sudden, the Supreme Court has your back. Um, so that's uh, that's going forward. Um, and you know, just and, and something that I'm sure will make Ron DeSantis very happy. They're going to ban affirmative action. Like that is that that program that policy one of the most sex, success, successful social policies in American history. That is gone in June. Um, when the Supreme Court gets around to overturning it. Last question. Uh, people may remember you mentioned the Dobbs decision. There was an early draft, which turned out to be pretty pretty much like the final draft, that was leaked uh, early last year, well ahead of its of its uh, official release. <laughs> what what happened with this Supreme Court investigation? I'm doing air quotes, getting carpal tunnel here. The investigation into the Dobbs decision leak. This was, seems about as thorough as the due diligence that Miami Dade County did on FTX before the arena, you know, naming rights deal got done. What was this? <laughs> what was the? And you're like the famous GIF of like the guy doing the pat downs, but he's not touching anybody. You know, like exactly. that. You just kind of wa you know, wanding his hands along the side of them. Like, what was this investigate? They turned up nothing. They have no idea who did it. It's a fine. It's a finite number of people who even had access to this damn thing in this building, and they can't figure it out? Billy, they don't know who did it because they don't want to know who did it. Sure, right. Because right. one of them did it. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, that, that's that's where we're at, right? The, right. Uh, uh, Samuel Alito, who wrote this, Samuel Alito wrote the Dobbs decision. A New York Times report um, already has come out saying that he has leaked sensitive information on prior decisions. <laughs> And yet, they did not ask Sam Alito under oath <laughs> if he leaked his own opinion. He was the person who had the most to gain from leaking the opinion. It was his, he had the most access to the opinion, and they never asked him under oath whether or not he leaked his own opinion. Tell me that they were actually trying to find who did it, right? Of course, of course, it was always a sham investigation, but why did they, why was this an issue in the first place? Because look, government leaks all the time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there's a reporter somewhere in Foggy Bottom in Washington, D.C., who already knows what the State of the Union is going to say, right? <laughs> like, government leaks all the time. Why was this leak such um, a national nightmare for conservatives? It's because they were trying to distract people from the underlying case. They were trying to get the media, and the media, for the most part, fell, followed along, you know, tail wagging the dog. Onto, oh my God, who leaked the information? As opposed to, oh my God, they're taking away reproductive rights for the first time in American history, right? The story should have been what they were doing, not how we found out about what they were doing. <laughs> but that's that's why they made a big fuss about it. And that's why ultimately the leak investigation came to nothing because it was never intended to do anything but distract. Read Ellie Mistal at thenation.com. Most importantly, 
buy his book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. Ellie, thank you, as always, for being here. Thank you so much, for Billy. Have a nice one. Thanks to Ellie Mistal. Thank you, Roy, for being the only person from the show who will still show up. Dan just like Dan's like I'm out I'm out of here. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> I hope Dan uh, gets back soon. Um, Want to leave you uh, as always with our new tradition. Uh, enjoy a, a moment of Zen, a, a Miami moment. This clip is from a 2019 City of Miami Commission meeting where Bill Fuller, one of the owners of uh, Ball and Chain, the bar that's been targeted uh, by Commissioner Como Mierda. Um, faces off with him back and forth uh, at this meeting. Um, tune into the YouTube for some Because Miami bonus content, very much in keeping with this subject matter. But for now, we'll see you next week. Here is your Miami moment, Cocaine's. In 1960, my uncle was executed in Cuba in a sham trial that lasted 24 hours in front of his mother, okay, when evidence was falsely provided. You gentlemen up here have been talking for the last half an hour of shutting down my business, which represents taxes, opportunity, uh, employment in your district. How dare you, sir? You know you've been targeting. Through the chair, please. You know that you have been targeting my business. Everybody in the city knows you've been targeting my business. You and this gentleman, Frank Pichel, were caught hiding in the bushes behind ball and chain, inciting my neighbors. Sir, you have lied about being with priests in the middle of the night. You are not well. And, the, and, and gentlemen, I know each and every one of you, please do not make this decision to shut down this business. Allow the due process to work itself out. The evidence he provided today was a lie. It is impossible in the city of Miami to pull an electric service permit in one day. That is impossible. That requires heavy lifting, permits, architecture fees, and all of that. He's somehow suggesting that when he targeted me, because I have evidence, and please let me remind everybody here, there is a federal case ongoing, and the lies, and the unethics, and everything, that this, and the crimes that this man has committed will come out for everyone. Please do not go down this way because this is the way that Cuba fell. This is the way my uncle lost his life is by people like this. Please do not do it. Commissioner Gore, you have been a champion of our district for years. Please do not allow this to happen. My companies, my employees, and my Viennes Culturales, the work that we have blood, sweat, and tears built that neighborhood. How dare you, sir, think that you have had any contribution to that neighborhood? You are, a, you are a shame, you are a disgusting human being, and you are not a representative of the Cuban people. You are not, sir. And you Thank are the you. biggest fraud that's hit Miami. Sir, you Mr. are a fraud that Why beats his wife, okay? That is you, a wife beater, okay? A wife beater. Please. You are a wife beater.